Hello everyone. I just got the thumbs up from the tech goddesses of Eckhart Yoga that we are now officially live. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining in on this uh, live streamed webinar. My eyes were closed when we went live. My heart is beating a little quicker than usual. In all honesty, my palms are a little bit sweaty and I have a bit of nervous energy running through my body. My name is David Lurie. I have been teaching yoga for 20 years of my life now. I've been teaching in front of large groups. I go to conferences and festivals. I have a guitar and I sing in front of people all the time. I also lead small groups and with my beloved wife, we create trainings together and every single time that I'm about to speak in front of people, there is a bit of nervous energy. With the experience that I have and uh, as much confidence as I have, I'm a person that uh, feels fairly confident to stand in front of people and, and speak and say things, I still get nervous. Welcome to this webinar on conscious communication. What I was just sharing with you uh, was not just a, a scripted opener. Here on my notes it says, be honest and sincere. And this is what was very real to me. And when moving forward to live a life of communicating consciously as a teacher, as a performer, as a parent, as a child, as an employee or as an employer, um, authenticity and even dare I say a sense of vulnerability is absolutely paramount meaning it's essential. It's a part of the deal to come across and to be a conscious communicator. Um, let me just first of all say that uh, I'm very honored to, to get to share some of this material and content. I am a deep believer and a practitioner of conscious communication, meaning that I pay attention to what comes out of my mouth, whether I'm teaching a class, engaging in a conversation with my friend. Okay, sometimes with my wife, we love to bicker back and forth. And like this, it's not always so conscious, but it's a great radical expression of, of what's real for me, which is part of this, uh, and I'll get to it in just a, a moment or two, that being able to express what's real and in the moment. Just a couple of logistics and an overview of this talk. Um, I'm going to give a little overview of the course that I have on the Eckhart Yoga Academy about conscious communication. That's one of the intentions of this webinar is to let you all know about that program and some of the details about it. Then uh, we're going to direct the conversation towards tips and teaching tips for teachers, whether it's returning to teaching on, uh, excuse me, returning to teaching in person after quarantine and lockdown, which for many of us is starting to open up and we're back engaged with other humans, or on the platform of teaching in an online environment. And I'll talk a little bit more about the difference and the variations of those. After uh, those themes and topics, uh, we're going to open it up to a bit of questions and answers. So if you have questions and when you have questions, and I hope that you do have some to ask, look for the chat window on the YouTube. So rather than in the comments section of this talk, um, I've heard rumors that it might be on the side of the screen, whichever one side it is. Uh, maybe if you're on your telephone, it might be in a different zone. So just if you have questions and when you have questions, please put them in the chat rather than as a comment. And uh, also to let you know that as part of sharing about the Conscious Communication course, those of you who have joined in on this webinar are also available to, or you will get a 20% discount on the course that will come in an email just after this talk, about an hour after this talk or so. So you'll get um, a discount to register and take the Conscious Communication course. 
So um, the program that there is, my Conscious Communication course, I believe it's a two-hour long program that has four different chapters. The first one is the body as a vehicle of sound. I am a true believer that the universe exists in vibration. Science might even back me up on this one, that uh, the universe existing in vibration especially has to do with our voices and the way in which we talk. And that includes vocal exercises and being aware of how we breathe when talking and presenting material. Also, clear and conscious way of speaking um, I was born in the United States. Uh, I was born in the state of North Carolina. And if I wanted to talk like I was from North Carolina, I can totally do it. I can put on a North Carolina accent for you. But it ain't the way I normally talk. Um, that little uh, example was to let you know that the way in which we speak, whether you have an accent or not, doesn't make such a difference. But I have been teaching yoga in English, mostly to non-native English speakers for most of my teaching path. So I have learned to speak slowly, to speak clearly. There's a beautiful English word that is enunciate. And to enunciate your words is to finish and end the words in a way that can be clearly understood. And it works in any language. Cuando hablo español, también podemos hacer esto to enunciate your words and, and use the sound of language to have an impact. During the body as a vehicle of sound chapter of the conscious communication course, we'll do some vocal exercises, meaning you're going to be singing out loud and using your voice to sing li, le, la, lo, and find out how opening and closing your mouth has a great impact especially if you're going to be communicating to several people, more than just one, using your mouth as a vehicle, using your tongue. I'm a, a big believer. My teacher, Eddie Modestini, gave me this beautiful phrase that the tongue is the gateway between the gross and the subtle bodies. So the outward physical part of us and the more inner aspects of our being. The tongue is this gateway between. So in addition to using the voice and the breath, we'll do some tongue exercises within that body as a vehicle of sound. Let's check something out right now. So wherever you are right now, clearly I won't be able to hear you. But I would like you to say, um, uh, the glass is on the table. Now say it like you were a little bit drunk. The glass is on the table. There is a difference in a way that you can communicate such a phrase. The glass is on the table. And say it in a way that, and you can even use your own language for this. Uh, the glass is on the table. Say it in a way that you actually enunciate the words and speak in a slow way. Maybe some of you are naturally slow talkers. Some of you might be really fast talkers naturally if you've had an extra coffee. So take a little moment and slow down and, and say the glass is on the table. Then close your eyes. And imagine you want to instruct someone where the glass is. And this someone doesn't hear so well and there's a lot of external noise. How can you say it in a way that they can understand where the glass is? Tell them right now. Okay. Little exercises and tools. This was a very spontaneous, improvised exercise. Within the, the course itself, we go through some more specific and concrete exercises about this. Um, so that's the body as a vehicle of sound. You can expect to breathe, move your body physically, and practice some vocal and singing exercises that come from the world of singing. The second chapter of the Conscious Communication course has to do with how we say what we say. And there are a few different components of this. I won't go so deeply into it uh, because uh, we have a whole program about that. But especially those of you that are teaching yoga classes or any kind of movement or 
anything. You could be teaching guitar, you could be teaching vocal, you could be teaching online uh, digital marketing. I outline four different aspects of how we say what we say and, and how to go about things as a teacher. The first thing is, what are the technical things that you're going to be teaching? As a yoga teacher, I always believe that this is the foundational aspect of effective and efficient teaching. Give the technique first. If it's yoga class, where do you put your hands and your feet? And then build from there the knees and, and the elbows and the hips and the shoulders and the spine. Start with technique and this will create an ambiance of safety for the students. Once the technique is covered, then the next layer, for those of you that wish to add it, will be some kind of philosophical insight. And when teaching yoga, those of you that have taken my classes, excuse me, on the Eckhart platform, you know that inspiration for philosophy can come from many different areas. It doesn't have to be classical yoga philosophy. And this is also true if you're teaching music, a language, writing, anything. How to add a layer of, of getting our students to think in a new way. If you do start to include philosophical intentions or philosophical teachings into what you are offering, first of all, Make sure you know what you're talking about. Um, so if it's yoga philosophy, the yoga sutras, some other form of philosophy, have a general working knowledge of what it's going to be and, and make it accessible to everyone. This is uh, something I'll get to in a little bit longer when I talk about, or a little bit later, when I talk about teaching in a non-dogmatic or a non-preaching way. Make sure that what you are saying is actually accessible to everybody. Not everybody is going to be able to digest yoga, chitta, vritti, nirodaha. Yoga is the intentional art and science of observing and calming the fluctuations of the mind. Hombre, ¿qué pasa? What are you talking about? This goes way over the head of, of many people who are coming just to have a stretch and a feel good for themselves. But you can include little nuggets of philosophy that as you're here in this pose, pay attention to your breath and gather your thoughts into here and now. This is exactly what that sutra says, but it's a digestible way for everybody. This leads actually to the next layer that I will prescribe and, and talk about in terms of the layers of teaching, and this is mindfulness. And it doesn't have to be only teaching yoga. This also, also is for teachers of just about everything. Our modern world, as we are experiencing right now, is very much based in technology. And the speed of technology and social media and the way it is growing and expanding is an open invitation to look to the future or to fall into the past. Scrolling through the feeds, and I do this all the time, looking at what has happened and then my fear of missing out gets accessed. Or looking into the future, oh, when I do this thing, it's going to be like this. So when you are teaching something, whether it's online or in person, how to bring a layer of mindfulness. And I just did it a moment ago when I said, gather your attention and your mind into here and now. And let's do it right now. We are here connected through technology. I'm looking into the camera, but I'm pretending that I'm looking into your eyes. Somehow I might be. And if I connect to the place in my heart and I look into the camera and there's an invitation for all of us here, have a look around and take a look at your surroundings. I know that I am in a studio. There are lights. There are the walls. There are the floor. For me, this is a familiar place. I'm aware of the surroundings, but I'm super present to it right now. Sounds. Smells different sensory experiences. And when you can bring this into any class, there is a present moment awareness that you can then offer wisdoms of your teachings. As the next layer of this teaching component, 
that I believe, and again, these four ports are something that I created, is to offer spiritual wisdom. And uh, my invitation to this is please make it authentic. Make sure that it is based in your spiritual personal disciplines rather than just repeating. When it is something that you've learned from your teachers, when it's something that's come along the way and, and you have the information and you love to share it from your teachers, then for sure repeat it, but let its roots come from your heart. Okay. So in this course, we look a little bit deeper into technical, philosophical, mindful, and spiritual approaches to teaching anything. There is also uh, an important piece of this, how we say what we say in terms of the language that we use. Not language in terms of English, French, German, Spanish, but language in terms of speaking things in a positive, affirmative way. Meaning that the universe has very big ears. So when we are constantly speaking and framing things in a negative perspective, the universe hears those things. And again, this is my belief system. So in speaking things in a positive, what do you want your students to do? How do you want them to place their feet? How do you want them to remember to breathe instead of don't forget to breathe? Language and words have many layers to their efficacy, their effect. So pay attention to every word. And when it's uh, valuable, use some don't do this and don't do that because there is a point. Uh, maybe it's even to trigger the don't tell me what to do attitude. Oh, I love this. I, I have this all the time in, in my life. Don't tell me what to do. And then there's an invitation. What is triggered inside of me? The rebel, the, the need to be in charge of things. And so many layers to look at that communication is the gateway. It's an access point to that. And we look at that in the how we say, what we say chapter of the communication course. The l second to last chapter is that our thoughts determine our world. And in this part of the conscious communication piece, we will do some meditation practices to center the mind, to align to the heart, and to observe each of our own individual thought patterns and our own thought processes. Because uh, it, this is, um, uh, I have changed the actual script that our thoughts become our words, our words become our actions, and our actions define our lives. It's a quote from Gandhi that probably is missing a few points. But you get the, you get the concept of it, that our thoughts are the roots of our entire existence. Thro so through meditation, through observation of thought processes, and quite literally reprogramming our thoughts on a conscious and or subconscious level. Shifting our thought processes have an impact extrapolated outwards into our entire life. The fourth part of the conscious communication uh, course is in fact a, a kirtan. It is mantra singing. I am a huge believer that singing is an important tool for cultivating your voice, the way that your sound comes out of your body. And whether you are a singer or not, this, uh, this mantra part of the communication course is an opportunity for you to lean into your edge a little bit, to sing out loud and, and tap into a way to use your voice to cause an impact because sometimes the voice dropped really low and done in a dramatic important way can gather the attention in such a way that no matter what you say there's an impact and sometimes you just need to make it fun and have a playful time with it. And singing is a good way to access your voice and be able to play with the full range of your voice. 
So there is a little overview of the Conscious Communication course, which is the impetus or the motivation for this webinar. But I'm going to shift gears and, and turn a little bit towards um, uh, some advice for yoga teachers. I'm a little nervous to say that I'm an expert on this, but because I have 20 years of experience, I've been teaching hundreds and hundreds of people, I have uh, a little bit of expertise on this. So um, here's some insight and advice on this. Number one rule, and it is the golden rule for any communication, authenticity is the key. Authenticity. Be sincere. I have to be completely honest with you. I've been practicing yoga for around 26, 27 years. I started 25 years. I started in 1995. And um, I had hopes that yoga would help me to put aside my judgments. I'm sorry to say, for better or worse, it's had a little bit the opposite effect because now I really have a strong filter for BS. I had to filter myself. I could have said the other word, but I don't know if that's allowed in the platform here. I have a strong filter for inauthenticity for the rainbows and the unicorns teachers and for the regurgitation just sharing something that you heard online or shared it somewhere else that doesn't necessarily resonate with you i believe that um this is a, such a valuable point of a teacher that it takes priority over how many followers you followers you have how many people come to your classes? And this is a tough one. It's an ego hit for sure. However, speaking authenticity and having a serious impact in one student or one person's life because you can speak and share authentically is far more valuable than having roomfuls of people that follow you because you're popular or because you say the things that they want to hear. That's tough. When you are able to share your truth and a sense of, of wisdom that you have done the work on in such a way that it might hit people fairly strongly and fairly intensely and they might feel rejected, they might feel discredited, but somehow underneath their sadness or anger is a, is a layer of truth for them I believe there is far more valuable, far more value in that than fluffing them up. Yeah, so be authentic. So we are now, I think it's 22nd of July, 2020. The coronavirus has taken the world into its globo and shaken it. And all of the snow is wrangling everywhere like this little souvenir that you bring back from everywhere you've been or everywhere that I've been. And I used to do that, bring that. So... Lockdowns, quarantines, isolations, yoga studios shut down. Um, fortunately, this is not a political or socioeconomic discourse. This is a conversation on communication. And now many of us are getting back to teaching live and in person after having had that removed for some time. So the first class is back. I have already taught a handful of classes at our home studio in Mallorca. I taught one public class last weekend in the Netherlands. And other than that, I've been here teaching to the camera in Eckhart Yoga. But I remember my very first class back when there were actual students after a two and a half month pause. I was really nervous. There were four students that came to the studio in Mallorca, and even just with four students. And I have a lot of comfort teaching in front of big groups of people. I sat down and I looked at them. And as I did at the beginning of this, this talk, I was uh, quite authentic. I said, oof, I have some nervous energy. My heart is beating a little quicker. Um, I'm a little nervous. I can fall back on my experience and just share the things that I always know how to do, but I don't want to do that. 
I want to have present moment experience with you all, my students. And so just to let you know, if I stumble on my words, if I fall back into cliches, I'm sorry about that, but I'm also getting back to my teaching voice. Okay, please close your eyes and let's go and begin the class. And, and after I taught the class from, from that brief vulnerable moment, not making it overly dramatic and also not ignoring it and pushing it away. Okay, I'm back as the teacher. I know how to do this. This created a personal connection and this is something that I really encourage and, and hope that you all will feel comfortable in doing is uh, uh, being vulnerable in an honest and a, and a sincere way in, in, a, in such a way that creates connection. Um, this is also possible to do in an online platform. I'm not sure how many of you there are on this live stream and it, it kind of doesn't matter so much, but I have spent the majority of the time looking directly to the camera. I've had pauses with just my eyes looking into the camera because I've been on the other side for a while and on the other side with friends of mine who are teaching online classes. And I know that although there is the physical distance of Wi-Fi and electromagnetic fields, and I'm looking into a piece of plastic covered with a plate of glass at this point, but I'm here and I'm having my human experience and you are there having your human experience. And when you as the teacher can bring that in an authentic, not overly dramatic way, then this adds great value to your online teaching. The online platform takes a lot of energy for you as the teacher to stay totally present. I experienced this when I was teaching uh, online for two months on the Eckhart uh, Facebook page, that for me to remember that there were however many people following the class online made me super present. Because I'll be totally honest with you, again, in my personal practice, I love to drift away. And I can go through movements and I can uh, go through a whole flow of a practice and be present for about half of it. And if I'm teaching a class, I want to be present for the whole of it. Not for me, for the safety of my body, but for the students and the participants in such a class. So be prepared that online teaching and continued online teaching can be quite an energy drain because it requires that sense of focus and a bit of imagination. I'm picturing 10,000 of you all <laughs> sitting around the computers and telephones. Maybe somebody's in a park with their headphones now. Hi, I see you. Maybe some of you are at home watching on a computer. Uh, I know a lot of you maybe are kind of keeping an eye on the kids or cooking dinner, things like this. Um, but I'm here for you. And I am calling upon my presence through the way that I speak, because that's all I'm doing now, rather than moving through poses, to cultivate and create authentic connection. It's an art and a science, somehow some of both. The science part, breathe while you teach. The science part, use a, a physical example to, to be present with people and tune your mind into here and now. The artistic piece Use a little bit of creative flair. There's a delicate line as yoga teachers between performance and sincerity. My personality is one that is a bit naturally of a performer. And I know that about me. 
but it's totally authentic. If you come to my house, um, I'm also giving a show to my wife and our kids, and, and I'm also slightly performing, but that's the nature of who I am. And find what's true for you and what's real for you to, to have a balance between that performance side of it and this uh, sincere, authentic piece of you as the teacher. I've been here in the Eckhart studio for the last three days recording classes. I'm going to let you in on a little bit of a secret that about 90% of those classes were totally improvised. I have a title, I have a theme, I have a concept that I want to talk about and a general overview of how I will move. This comes with my experience. This is also part of my nature. So if you are able to show up and, and improvise teaching, there is an art to that. And it's not for everybody. Those of you that are gaining and cultivating your teaching voice, I really want to encourage you and, and invite you to show up with a plan. Both a theme or a topic to talk about and also your sequence, whether it's the whole sequence scripted out pose by pose or a general outline of how you wish to do it. So for bigger programs, for things that might have other yoga teachers involved, come with a plan and, and have your plan ready and be able to both stick to it so that you are comfortable and confident in what you will say and do, and also gain the muscle of improvisation because you never know who's going to show up and who's going to be in your classes. So this uh, ability to improv. Um, then there's a, a really interesting part that I talked about, uh, the authenticity and how to not have your teaching be dogmatic, being telling people what to do and what is right and what is wrong. Um, when I was young, I used to love that, telling people the right way to do things and the wrong way to do things. And yoga says to do this, and this is how you should be behaving in such a way. Um, when I stepped into our family, I became an instant father of a 15 and a 13-year-old. This was about 12 years ago. Our kids are big now. I learned very quickly through them, this doesn't work. So, some tips on not telling people what to do. And there's a huge bit of irony here because I'm telling you what to do. But I'm the teacher. So, we have this role and this dynamic here. First and foremost, speak from the place of I. So, I language. Um, this is a broad generalization, but in the United Kingdom, there is a, a way of using and speaking English that says, and you take the leg into downward facing dog, and you step this forward. And, and I even do it a few times, like when we are practicing conscious communication, you can use your words in such a way. And, and I pay extra attention to make things coming from my experience. Not only does it make it a more neutral way of communicating, but it also adds depth because I am going to be vulnerable and share what my experience is with you. I feel this way. How that can look in a yoga class is something like when you bring the hands to the heart center, I often feel a sense of gratitude for life itself. Something like this, and there is also a, a bit of a gray area here that you can say, bringing the hands to the heart center and, and cultivate a sense of gratitude for life itself. Or can you experience life or gratitude for, for life itself? In sharing your personal experience, rather than projecting onto others, you will gain a sense of trust from your students because they know that you are sharing from your experience. And also, I mentioned before, the, the rebel won't show up. Well, you're not telling me how I feel and you can't tell me what to do. 
So when you speak from the I perspective and give your personal experience, this will add a beautiful layer of depth and it will take your teaching away from being preachy. And another tool for bringing depth and sincerity is the power of the pause. It's tough. I'm a talker. I love to talk. I can talk fast and entertain. I can also go slow and have more profound things to say. And one of the more challenging things for me as a teacher is to say less. And there's an art to that. Because in that pause, I will argue that it needs to be set up. You can't just drop the pause somewhere in the middle of a sentence because people will be like, huh, what, what's going on like that? But when you set it up and you bring something to a deep and powerful moment as a teacher, as a parent of anything in life, and then all of a sudden you can capture them and you've got the attention and then the pause hits. You've got it right there. This powerful giving space, especially with the amount of input that humans have right now through news, through social media, constant input, emails, messages, da 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 a little bit of time and pause could actually be far more valuable than a 10-minute headstand. A little bit of pause, a little bit of space and safety. The last piece that I'll talk about, and then I will um, open it up to some more questions, and I see one or two coming in already, so great, I will get to them in just a moment. Uh, and those of you that do have questions, please post them, and they are being moderated and sent to me. The art of listening. As a teacher in an asana class or something like this, um, you may not be listening to the words because uh, most students won't be talking in, excuse me, in the classes, but you listen to body language, you listen to energy. And, and to get out of our own way as the teacher, when I was a younger teacher, I always wanted to teach what I had planned and because I knew what was best for the class. And over time, I feel I've learned a little bit of listening to reading a class and seeing what's accessible. But as the focus here is on, on communication, it also lends itself to general conversation. And this is an important thing to pay attention in your own inner sphere. When you are having a conversation with someone, if they make a point that either you agree with or you disagree with, and there is already a response formulating in your own head, I know that when that happens to me, I am no longer listening. I have my answer, I have my point that I need to make, I need to put myself higher than them, prove something that I know that I am no longer listening and this is a great breach of conscious communication. So even when I am listening to someone and I have a point that I want to make, that I have a, a, something that I want to say, I will somehow put it in the back of my head, be like, oh yeah, I will remember that. Let me be with this person now. Eye contact, breath, presence, and the art of listening. When it comes to listening, there is a, an important part in a conversation of, I like to share what I heard from someone. What I heard was this, and I even say it like that. Here's what I heard from this. Can you confirm that, or is this accurate? Because I know in my conversations, well over half of them, I love to project my own stuff onto others. 
I'm projecting my biases, my political perspectives, my spiritual beliefs, my experience, blah, 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 blah. I love to throw it up all over people. So in uh, the art of listening, the first thing to do is make sure that what I've heard is what this person really said. What I heard was this, and, and here's how I perceive that. And, and this also gives a great sense of comfort to the one that was just speaking. Remember the last time someone actually listened to you? Oh, I might even get a little bit teary now. The last time I felt really heard and seen without needing to be fixed without needing for anything to be solved. How can each one of us give someone that feeling that there's not broken, there's nothing to fix, even if there is something totally wrong? I see you and hear you where you are right now. Boom. That is power. Um... Okay, I'm looking at the clock, and we've got about 20 minutes left and a couple questions here. So uh, I'm going to look at the questions from, from Karen and uh, happily to, to answer some of those. And if you have any other questions or comments, please put them in the chat of the, of the YouTube, and they will be moderated and sent to me via the gifts of technology. Is it possible to guide a meditation using I language? Thank you, Karen. Beautiful question. Totally. Absolutely. And this is where um, projecting my opinion onto communication is, is being experienced right now. Um, that uh, this is a really great point that in creating a group atmosphere, in creating cohesion in a group, using the general you and using we. And, and if you are participating in the meditation, I would invite the word we rather than you. And I think this also fits in, in all languages, that, that to be able to speak from, from we and include yourself. So uh, I didn't mention that before I talked about I language, but when you're creating a group atmosphere, use we. And... Um, in terms of this question, I would encourage you to, to experiment and play with it. Uh, and, and now that I'm thinking about it and processing, we, I feel, is the, the more accurate use of personal experience in meditation. Uh, next question, also from Karen. I don't know if it's the same Karen, the Karen I know. Is it you, Karen, my questioner? Uh, if I find silences and pauses especially difficult when teaching online, as I worry they will think I have lost the connection. Yes, fantastic. Great, great question. Um, just today, I was recording a class, and I had a moment of silence in child pose. And I actually said, the video is still going. I'm going to be silent for a few moments. Because, yes, I've also been on the other side. And a moment of silence comes, oh, no, buffering, pause, the internet is broken. So, so yeah, great question. And, and my invitation to you is actually to presence that. So, Yes, if you want to make an impact and use the pause to make a certain point, then it might not be as long that you have to say something like, I'm going to be quiet now. But if you are guiding or creating a more insular moment, say, I'm going to be quiet now and let's just trust that the video is going to still be running. Uh, this brings up something that I also wanted to say that in being real and being authentic, um, I find myself to be very funny. And, and you can use humor in such a way to create that authenticity. And this can also happen when you talk about that pause. By the way, your internet, I don't think is going to be frozen. I'm going to be quiet for a moment and just trust that I'll be back. 
And so, yeah, use it in a way and, and set it up in the online uh, format. So thank you, Karen, for that. Manuela has asked, I often struggle with themes of what I want to share with my people. Tips to train for that. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm actually in the next few days going to be uh, working on a new course about mixed movement in yoga, but there's going to be a layer about that, about bringing depth into classes. Bring real life experiences Every human has emotions and goes through them in relationships and family and life and job, etc., etc. So some advice and tips for that is to take what's going on in your real life and rather than bring the story or the personal drama about it, do personal work. Why am I triggered by this? What, uh, why am I afraid of this? Why am I sad? What's going on in my real life? And take it a layer outwards. And in this outward layer, well, I have, uh, this is me speaking personally, I have fears of rejection. I have fears of not being good enough. Those are two of my uh, demons on the shoulders. So if I'm going to teach a class and, and I know that... Um, Currently, I'm dealing with my fear of missing out because I have fear of being rejected and not invited to conferences and festivals. Then, then I would come up and I would say, okay, today we're going to look at a feeling of belonging. And this is something that I, I'm working with in my life right now. So close your eyes and, and take a moment and call it into your real life. I'll tell you from me personally, I'm looking at uh, fear of rejection. Maybe that speaks to you or something like this. Or where in your life do you feel like you're struggling to belong? And let that be a theme. It doesn't always need to be something uh, serious or we could say on the more negative side of the emotional spectrum. It could also be something on the positive side, like, wow, I have a great experience. I have my family coming to visit, and I find great joy in, in rekindling those relationships. So today's theme is going to be about rekindling and reigniting personal relationships and somehow tie it in. Um, that's on a very personal level. You can also uh, use all kinds of things. Are you reading any books right now? Take a topic, take a theme, and what doesn't need to be a spiritual or a yoga book. Um, I'm reading the book right now about the stories of Motley Crue, the American rock band from the 80s and 90s, and they were doing cocaine and horrible, misogynistic, dreadful things to humans and to women around the world. And... and uh, for my gender, I apologize on behalf of Motley Crue, but I kind of get a little bit of the rock and roll lifestyle. And so I'm looking at some of those stories and I'm seeing how I don't want to behave to other people. And I pick that up as a theme and like, okay, when I see something that I don't like, how can I recreate it? I have a class on Eckhart Yoga just released last week called From Irritation to Inspiration. And it's exactly that. Some things that touched me or bothered me in a story and create a theme in a class on it. Um, I have my handy, my telephone right here with me. And I have a, a notes page of sentences and themes that I want to use as themes for classes. So whenever you have a sentence or a theme, something that touches you in a personal way, make a note for it. And there is great growth for a class there. Um, okay, a question from Jenny from Eckhart Yoga related to uh, Karen's question of silence. What do you think about talking in Shavasana and would you announce when you're about to go quiet? So thank you, Jenny. Um, in Shavasana and talking in Shavasana and not. Those of you that have studied any trainings with me before, here comes my famous answer. It depends. Silence in Shavasana is extremely valuable and very important in today's world of constant input. 
the moments of silence in Shavasana have great values for the student. And when it's in an online platform, it's a bit tricky, meaning that there are two aspects to it. The Eckhart Yoga platform are pre-recorded classes. So in my pre-recorded classes, I keep the Shavasanas oftentimes a little bit short. Sometimes I pick up the guitar. Sometimes I guide them because people are at home and doing all kinds of things. Let's shift and look at another aspect of that in like a Zoom class or a live interactive class. Um, yes, I would for sure make an announcement. I'm going to be quiet for four or five minutes here. Let's all of us just trust that the technology will keep working. I'm going to guide everybody out of Shavasana and we will finish the class together. But for now, I go into silence. In the online platform, I personally do think that it's important to announce when there will be silence because of the fear of technology breakdown. That being said, if you want to talk or not in Shavasana, there are ways to guide things. I just recorded a class two hours ago called Shavasana Serenades, and it's a 15-minute, 10 minutes of guided introduction to Shavasana, a few minutes of silence, and a little song. It's really a personal nature. And this is where each one of you will hopefully tap into your authentic way of being a teacher. Trust yourself to know the difference when silence is the right thing, when a guided Shavasana is the right thing, or when a beautiful, soft, no drums piece of music is playing. Those would be the three options for Shavasana, and I use them all three. Trust yourself to feel into the space what is called forth. Yeah, make it authentic and make it real. Okay, another question from Mary. For the class intent, I often refer to something in my personal experience that has triggered this thought idea. Some t teachers disagree of bringing your personal stuff into class. What are your thoughts? Um, there's a fine line between this. And the fine line is the difference between this. And I've used this example. Anyone who's been in our teacher trainings know about this. Okay, so you come into the class and you sit down. And there you are, the teacher. <sighs> Today's class, we're going to look at trigger points because I am really triggered and touched off because I got in an argument with my partner and she said this thing and it made me so angry angry and I really want to process and I want to burn through that anger and today's class is going to be a fiery class to to get through that thing that's just happening to me right now example number one example number two <sighs> welcome um I have to let you know I'm going through some intense things right now in my personal life that uh, I'm not going to come and project them onto you, but I have a lot of fire and a lot of passionate energy going on right now. And for better or worse, we're all here together. So I'm going to invite you all and all of us together to have a fiery class experience to burn through some of this. So whether or not you have some of that anger or, or powerful, radical energy going on, Maybe you could do it for me or for your neighbor because for sure, I'm not the only one. Let's go together and take some of this uh, fire and passion and burn through it in this class. So here is that fine line between projecting our own personal drama and using it as inspiration and fuel for a class. That's my thoughts on that. Thank you for the question, Mary. Laurel, how David, I tuned in a bit late, so maybe you covered this, but are you things to get your voice ready to teach any vocal warm-ups? Um, I did cover it towards the very beginning and um, uh, on a daily basis. 
for the last 15 years of my life, and here we go, I hope my hands are clean. There is a class on Eckhart Yoga platform. I even have some uh, videos around it on YouTube. I milk my tongue. This is my number one tool for those of you whose voices may get tired in projecting your voice or speaking for an hour of time. Do you want to zoom in, Liana? I know you wanted to get the tongue. So here we are. Milking the tongue. I am a trained professional. That's about all we're going to get to the milking of the tongue for now. Um, I use my bare hand. In the, uh, in the full course, I teach how to do it with a towel. And, and it is a practice that is extremely, extremely valuable. Your voice is the vehicle. So really massage and milk the tongue every day. My morning routine, I scrape my tongue, I brush my teeth, and then I massage and milk it. And I talk a lot. From a more vocal singing perspective, uh, in the course itself, there are a couple of uh, singing techniques that we go through to open the mouth and the voice and, and also changing the low range up to the high range. And, and there are a handful of vocal exercises. If I'm just coming to teach kind of a regular class, I don't so much do it because I have a lot of experience using and projecting my voice. For those of you that are new to speaking loud and clear enough for everyone to hear you, sure, some of this, I think I'm going to move the microphone to the side for a moment. This one for a minute or two. And even with the tongue. Um, I know sometime when I go to do um, mantra singing and more musical events in the car on the way over, I will either put on the radio and hopefully it's on rock FM and, and there's a, a great Led Zeppelin or a Bob Dylan song and I can sing on it. Or if there's not, then I go the lee le la lo li le la lo uh, the li le la lo and open your mouth through the whole thing li le la lo through a variety of octaves is an important vocal warm-up that can for sure get you ready to project and have a loud clear voice um so so I hope that gives you a little bit of insight there, Laurel, and I invite you to get a hold of your tongue. If uh, in the beginning, if you're very new and it's kind of a, a freaky exercise for you, find a very thin towel, a washcloth, and, and check it out. It's possible that mucus will come. You might need to... No needs no further explanation. Get rid of the mucus that's there. Um, okay. So if there are any more questions, now would be the, the time to put them in the chat. And while that's going on, um, two important things about the recap of this. Let's say three important things. Number one, thank you. Um, this communication is something I'm very passionate about talking and sharing. Uh, and especially the speaking from the I and the personal experience. Bring that into all aspects of life. Secondly, this uh, online course about conscious communication is on the Eckhart Yoga platform. In about an hour or so, you will get an email from Eckhart Yoga with a discount for a 20% discount to sign up for the course. I have to be totally honest with you, I have no idea how much the thing costs. But go visit the Academy Eckhart Yoga, search it, you will find it, and there will be a code. However, something important with this. This discount of 20% is only valid for 48 hours. So those of you that work on intranet marketing, yes, someone on our team does as well. So this 20% discount for the Conscious Communication course is only valid uh, for 48 hours. It's a great course. I mean, I think so. Uh, it will give you new insights and tools and specific tools for, for vocal warm-ups and things like this, and also new layers of how we say what we say and about our thoughts and some meditation. Um, 
Also, the final piece about this was uh, one of our Eckhart Yoga member or one of our Eckhart Yoga team members uh, has been busily typing up some key points to this. And we'll put it either into an article or a blog post on the Eckhart Yoga website. It may be a little while because we have a lot of great information to share, but sign up for the Eckhart Yoga newsletter or the Academy newsletter, some of both. Make sure that you get our information. Follow Eckhart Yoga on the social media channels and you will find out when the recap in a a text document of this talk will be sent out uh, to somehow um, support you in conscious communication. So I take one last look and no new questions have come in here. Let's take a moment because um, authenticity and connection are two of the most valuable tools of a yoga teacher. They are two of the most valuable tools of a parent and of a child, of an employer to an employee or the other way around, to a passenger to the bus driver, authenticity and connection. And to cultivate that takes a bit of courage And our role, and dare I say, responsibility as yogis in the world, and however you define yourself as a a yogi, is to be the first one to open the door to vulnerability, to be the first one to really and sincerely listen. And through the art and the science of communication, speaking clearly, listening intently and feeling, there we can have a big impact for our students and for humanity. Thank you very much. I hope to see you at the communication course or on all of the classes on Eckhart Yoga. And if you see me on the street, stop and say, hey, you're the dude. And there is your opportunity to be vulnerable. And I will say, oh, I'm that guy. Nice to see you. Bye-bye.